Thanks, Council. You both are. Okay, very good. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, just to, you know, just to echo very quickly, Mara, Rafa, Lisa, Elise, the organizers, for the opportunity to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, we're going to spend the next half an hour. I'm going to be sharing some thoughts and reflections on this topic, thinking about tragic choices, ethical uncertainty, and least worst options in the context of humanitarian healthcare. Um, and then uh, there'll be a chance for some uh, sort of questions and response or dialogue. And then uh, looking forward to the panel as well, where we think we'll transition from thinking about healthcare provision and move on to the question of health research in the context of situations of crisis. Uh, the other part that's already been done is the acknowledgments. I'm just going to echo this one piece. Uh, the work that I'm presenting under my name is really uh, the fruit of the labors of a, a collective of uh, collaborators, and that's the Humanitarian Health Ethics uh, group. And I want to acknowledge that the analysis in particular uh, draws on collaborations with Christina Sinding, with Nikki Fraser, with Lisa Schwartz, uh, a number of the elements that lead into the presentation today related to tragic choices. And the work uh, presented here is funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and I hold a Research Scholar Award from the FRQS. I have two objectives, in uh, broad objectives in this presentation. The first is to examine this idea, this concept of tragic choices, to try and look at the nature of tragic choices, the sources of tragic choices in humanitarian healthcare. And to make that more tangible, I'm going to look at two particular instances where I see this arising. Um, and really drawing on the interviews that we've done with humanitarian healthcare workers. And these are what uh, I'll call here dilemmas related to competency. So particularly dilemmas related to people needing to make choices when uh, a patient's need is really at the periphery, at the cusp, or at the limits of their clinical competency, their scope of practice, when there isn't another option for care. What sort of choices do they make then? And then the second are dilemmas of patient selection. I'll tell you more in uh, just a few moments, but there it's a choice uh, where their decision must be made between groups of patients or amongst patients who will receive needed care when everyone needs that care, but care can't be provided to everyone. These are tragic choices I want to argue, and I'll tell you why uh, that is so. And then the second piece is to try and move from that analysis to say, well, what then? Uh, how might uh, we, uh, as individual uh, individuals involved in humanitarian healthcare, or how might we, as teams of people involved in humanitarian healthcare projects, or how might we, as a humanitarian organization, plan for and respond to tragic choices? That's the roadmap, and I hope we get to those places. Uh, we're a diverse group. I know already that many of the people in the room are students. Uh, there are also people in the room who are very experienced uh, humanitarian uh, workers, and I imagine also on the webinar. So just acknowledging that diversity, I just wanted to say a few things about the context in which this analysis uh, is meant to take place. I'm thinking particularly of the actions of international humanitarian organizations often responding in situations of crisis or catastrophe. These might be what we describe as sort of like an acute or a sudden onset uh, disaster, an earthquake that occurs, and there's a response. There are also situations that we sometimes talk about as chronic emergencies or perpetual emergencies. Um, there are situations that are acute on chronic. Uh, so there's a chronic situation of instability or deprivation, and then there's an acute event that occurs. So, this is the context, but it might be situations of war, or political strife, or turmoil. It might be a natu so-called natural disaster, as I just mentioned, earthquakes or tsunami. Uh, it could be something like a bio disaster, such as Ebola or disease outbreak. These are the that's the ambit of what I'm thinking about. Uh, and some obvious things to say: these are situations where needs for the population are elevated and widespread, where the resources available to respond to those needs, given the urgency, um, or just simply given the situation of scarcity are limited. Often you'll also see accompanying this sort of situations where there is political instability or strain and social strain within communities in situation of catastrophe. So we can see all these things. And the humanitarian dimension also signifies that local resources to respond to the situation of crisis have been um, stretched to the limit or have been exceeded. And so there's an, uh, a response from the outside. And in the context of international humanitarian action, often international organizations responding. And these organizations largely employ people from within those nations. In some instances, nine out of 10 
people working for international humanitarian organizations are from the very country where the crisis has occurred. Um, and that's important to acknowledge. And the analysis of tragic choices applies to all people working with these humanitarian organizations, given the fact that we're standing here, I'm standing, you're sitting at McMaster University, is also to acknowledge that there'll be many people from a place like McMaster, a city like Hamilton, who will work as volunteers or work for humanitarian organizations as well. And I'll just say something about humanitarian health work as might be taken up by uh, those folks, folks like you or folks like me uh, in that context, some of the things we could say. These are situations where there might be uh, a disjuncture between the way people have been trained and often the context of their practice. And you might ask, well, what's the way in which that expertise travels and the transferability of that expertise, not just clinically, which is true, but other dimensions of expertise? Um, there might be less that can be taken for granted. Um, greater uncertainty in different dimensions, knowledge of culture or social, or these background uh, conditions and contexts in which healthcare is provided. I want to suggest that as an individual, they also lack uh, access to familiar resources, resources in the broad sense, even access to a wide range of colleagues that they can call upon, uh, maybe a lack of consensus in terms of how to respond, or uncertainty, those reference points that are important in terms of figuring out well, how to act in a particular set of circumstances. And there might be less accountability and oversight in that context. So um, we could ask this question, what does it take to be <laughs> Uh, this was supposed to come out one at a time, but it came out all together. What does it take to be a humanitarian worker in that context? And uh, going back a number of years, Susan George provided a response to this question with her tongue firmly planted in her cheek. She offers this as a caricature. Given that context, what does it take? One must have graduate degrees in social anthropology, geography, economics, a dozen or so difficult and unrelated languages, Medicine, business administration, competence in agronomy, hydrology, practical nursing, accounting, psychology, automotive mechanics, and civil engineering. In addition, they must learn to give a credible imitation of saintliness. Uh, I, I, she goes on to say something about magic and needing to know something about sleight of hand. Um, but the idea being that there are all these things that are in the uh, background of this idealized, satirized <laughs> humanitarian worker. And, and the notion of needing to give a credible imitation of saintliness also, what, what does it take in terms of attitude and disposition and moral posture. What I especially wanted to point to is the addition made by Hugo Slim. He came along after the humanitarian community's experiences in places like Bosnia and Rwanda. And commenting on that and in the same spirit, sort of saying, well, the humanitarian worker idealized must also be something of a moral philosopher. And he's not suggesting that people need necessarily to do a PhD in philosophy, though that is a very good thing to do. Um, he's suggesting that there is something uh, unavoidable, inextricable about humanitarian health work that takes, uh, takes on this importance of grappling with the ethical dimensions of practice, that there will be conflicting values and commitments that people need to think carefully about to seek to reconcile. And I would recommend to you the writings of Hugo Slim if you're interested in the topic today. I think he's the most interesting and thoughtful um, person really uh, examining these questions now at the ICRC as a policy advisor. We've done some work thinking about that, so just the, you know, probing that idea of the ethical dimensions of humanitarian work. And this is a paper led by Lisa um, that we published several years ago where we traced back some of the sources of ethical challenge. When we talk to people about where do their ethical challenges come from, and I won't go into detail about it, I'll just sort of signal there are four areas of source. Uh, resource scarcity, the need to allocate these scarce resources, inequalities associated with sort of underlying social, political, or even commercial dimensions, uh, structures, sometimes agencies, policies, or mandates could be sources of ethical challenge. I'll quickly add that policies also can be the sorts of things that mitigate ethical challenge or alleviate them, but they in themselves could also be sources of ethical challenge. And then conflicting uh, expectations about professional norms. And so I won't go into the details of that. I would you know, suggest that you could uh, look at the paper if you're interested or we can talk about it. But I want to tell you three things about the moral experience about those ethical challenges. So when we talk to people and we ask them, and we looked at sort of what are the effects or the impacts of uh, these challenges, they talked uh, at several levels. One was situations where there was an experience or a sense in which um, they struggled to uphold their core moral convictions, the things that were important to them as a 
you know, they themselves, their personal ethics, if you will, uh, and struggled to uphold them in a context that was an inequitable. Sometimes struggled to uphold them when there were different values and uh, you know different uh, ethical values at work in a community or different commitments of an organization. So their sense of what it meant to be uh, an ethical person was sometimes challenged. The second was about their professional morality. So people would say that there were instances they were in a situation where they felt that they couldn't do some of the things that were intrinsic to being a good doctor or a good nurse or a good X or a good Y. So there were things that they thought were, okay, this is what it is to be to act ethically uh, and uphold my professional identity, and they struggled to do that. So the personal dimension, the professional dimension. And the third was that they said that uh, someone described this as one of the most important um, psychological morbidities associated with this type of work was the weight of ethical challenges, what they carried with them from the tough, uh, the tough decisions that they had made. And that sort of weight, or the what I'm going to call residue, or people have described as uh, a moral residue of these uh, really challenging situations, gets us on to the notion of tragedy in humanitarian work. Another really interesting thinker about this is Alex DeWall, who wrote a paper about the humanitarian's tragedy, uh, the notion of escapable and inescapable cruelties. And he describes uh, the escapable, uh, this set of things that are the failings, the operational failings, the failings of planning, the things that can be ameliorated through uh, improvements in the humanitarian system, getting better at doing good, uh, maybe by expanding the evidence bases we'll talk about later, but other ways of sort of improvement. And yet, sort of recognizing, uh, as the quote is here, that there's this tragedy that might be inescapable of having these high ideals. There might be a dissonance between having these ideals that motivate the response and trying to carry them out in a situation where there will be a gap between what we aim to do and the outcomes that are possible. And he says, both well, the tragedy of goals that cannot be reconciled amongst themselves and the inevitable outcome of pursuing ideals amidst the most horrific constraints of war and violent social upheaval. He talks about it in that context. So just bringing in the notion of tragedy or the tragic between this dissonance that might be experienced. And as I've already uh, said from the first slide, I'm going to be thinking about tragic choices, which might be uh, one dimension of that. We think of tragedy in the ancient Greek sense of tragedy, that there's something inherent about um, human strife or human struggle and catastrophe that can't be fully resolved. So these tragic choices um, might be considered those situations where we face a choice that there will inevitably, the, all the options that are available to us are problematic, morally problematic in some way. Regardless of the choice that is made, something of moral significance will be given up. And sometimes, you know, one other way of putting this would be that even the most virtuous person faced with this choice will end up with dirty hands because of the decision that's made. So uh, one way, uh, another way of putting it would be, uh, you know, looking for the least worst option in a particular situation because there's no good option available. And it reflects this insoluble, unsolvable, irresolvable nature of catastrophe. I suggested a moment ago the psychological morbidity. I think it comes to tragic choices sometimes. You know, the idea of insoluble, if you think back to chemistry class, we have molecule or, you know, we might uh, mix two liquids together, insoluble, the water and the oil that are going to stay apart. Uh, maybe we should think about tragic choices as only partially soluble. That no matter how much we stir, there's always going to be a residue left over in the bottom. And those might be those that ethical dimension that can't be fully resolved regardless of the choice that is made. That might be the source of regret that uh, is carried, carried forward. So uh, here is where I'm going to tell you about these two examples. So the example of competency dilemmas and the dilemmas of patient selections. Because that might have sounded abstract and even sort of uh, vague. I want to be more tangible about the tragic choices through these illustrations. The first are situations of uh, what we've called competency dilemmas. And we've uh, written a, a paper about this, uh, and the title actually comes from an interview where someone says, how far do you go and where are the issues surrounding that? In humanitarian uh, work, there are situations, whether it's because of gaps in staffing, sometimes they can't find someone to fill a gap in the human resources of the project. Uh, maybe it's a situation where the surgeon has gone away for a few days from the project, and that's the moment when a woman in obstructive labor arrives at 
the treatment center. There might also be situations where the program is set up to only provide one type of care and someone arrives in an emergency situation. It's a cholera program and someone arrives needing care that the team's not equipped or uh, set up to provide and there isn't another option in terms of referral. So these might be examples of what might lead to a competency dilemma. There are the situations where people are making these choices, that there's a, a need that exists somewhere near the limits of the competency of the team and the way that they're equipped. And so they're asking the question, what do I do in this situation? Obviously there are legal dimensions that might change depending on the context in which it's going to take place. There are ethical dimensions. Right now I just want to use this as an illustration of the tragic choice. I'm going to show you two quotations from uh, interview participants who faced this sort of decision. The first is described by uh, an obstetrician who's a surgeon who has been you know, practicing for many years and only conducting surgery on women. And she's suddenly in a place where uh, a sudden disaster has occurred and she's the only surgeon available. And she's asking herself, Do, am I going to operate on men and on children? And she describes opening up the textbook uh, before starting the procedure and she asks uh, a question that really is framed as a tragic choice, a least worst option. She says, I have to make a decision, which is the better of two bad options, having the wrong surgeon operate or not operating and dying. The second quote is from someone who chooses not to act in this situation, a nurse describing uh, a circumstance where there isn't a physician available, where patients are presenting with medical problems that she feels uh, exceed her scope of practice and yet not so far exceeding her scope of practice that it's just impossible to contemplate. And yet she's faced by these things, these situations that people are asking her to provide this assistance. Sometimes I was asked to do stuff that doctors do and the child died because I didn't do it. I felt that I wasn't a doctor, I felt that I couldn't do it, but it was the only thing to do and the child ended up dying. So you can see the weight of these decisions Sometimes, even when the situation seemed clear, the decision they needed to make, it still was a decision that felt terribly unjust to have to make in the circumstance. Clearly, most terrible for the people, the patients, who were receiving care or not receiving care, and were, if receiving care, weren't receiving care from the right person, um, and what would happen in that circumstances. So all these levels of the tragedy. And this is the second example, the dilemmas of patient selection. So we've I uh, published another paper on this topic, so I'm drawing together pieces of our work. And the title here, I'll just flag it for you again, taken from uh, what one of the participants said, playing God because you have to, was how they described this situation. That there were instances of making uh, choices where certain groups of patients would receive, or certain groups of individuals, or individual patients would or would not receive care. And there were different uh, reasons why this happened because of scarcity and needing to allocate scarce resources, sometimes for public health rationales, sometimes because of policies, and sometimes because of organizational mandates. And I'm going to share again the same structure. I'm going to share two quotes that show uh, another dimension of the tragic choice. The first uh, quotation is from a nurse who's responsible managing a, sort of a, a, cl a clinic context where she is responsible for the resources that are available to them. And there's a child who arrives who's had a traumatic head injury and a serious neurological injury. And if she chooses to transfer this patient to the regional center, they will have to pay for the transfer and they have to pay for the child's care once uh, he arrives at the hospital. They're unable to provide that care in the location where they are. And so uh, she has, has to contemplate that decision and so she decides not to transfer him and to conserve the resources to help other future uh, patients. And so this, like the current patient now and the future patient, she says, there are a lot of kids in pneumonia that need resources, and if you give them the resources, they will get better. I decided not to transfer the kid, and he went home. I will always remember that kid. I think I made a right decision. I let him down. I may not have let these other kids down in the sense that those resources were available for others, but I let him down. The second quote comes from someone who is responsible for making decisions about who to receive in a treatment center. And they had clinical standards in terms of who they were going to accept. And she describes a situation where she doesn't follow the protocol. 
And the reason why she doesn't follow it is that this is the last surviving child of a family. And so she decides to accept this child into the treatment center because of that. And she says, even though the ethical choice may have been not to take her and keep the space for somebody else, I still felt, I still feel it was the right thing to do to admit the patient. So what I want to point out, we had that first description of the first competency dilemmas with these situations of least worst options. And the second I want to pull out from the, this example is not only were they least worst options, but people feel pulled in multiple directions and couldn't resolve the decision. In both of those quotes, people were saying the decision was right and it was wrong. It might have been ethical, more ethical to save the, play, the, the place in the treatment center for somebody else, but I still think I made the right decision in the situation. So they feel this pull, they feel this tension, even though they've come to a decision. So back to the tragic choices. So we think about those examples. Um, in these situations of tragic choice, there are the two characteristics I just described, and there's this nature of the, the weight or the residue that holds. People will experience uh, distress or regret over the frustration of other significant concerns. Uh, Nussbaum writes about this very eloquently. Uh, and, and here's the thing. People might feel that their decision, they may even come to a place where they felt that the decision was justified, but it still might not feel just. And they're making a decision in a situation where there might be no uh, just possibility because the situation is itself profoundly unjust, that the decision needs to be made. So I want to come on to this question, well, how then do we best support, or what are the opportunities for supporting humanitarian uh, health workers to make tragic choices? Uh, DeWall, who I uh, quoted at the beginning, said that this is not a topic that humanitarian workers are trained to anticipate and to cope with. I think, and this was in 2010 that he, he wrote this, I think that there is actually uh, a great deal more that's being said and addressed in humanitarian organizations related to ethics, even in the last few years. More organizations are including this in their training, are creating opportunities within organizations to think and engage with these ethical dimensions. But there are still, uh, there's still room for making improvements in terms of how we do this. And it's in that spirit that I'd like to suggest the following. I want to frame up this idea um, in terms of how do we respond to tragic choices, these profoundly uh, challenging situations, uh, is maybe in terms of thinking about the Aristotelian notion of phrenesis, or practical wisdom, or prudence. So this is a, a concept that really captures something, I think, important about these tragic choices. The definition here is the capacity to deliberate well and to judge the correct means for achieving good ends. Sometimes we think of it in this way. It's this capacity, this ability that people can develop over time to be able to examine a particular circumstance, to identify what's morally salient, what's uh, important, and then to be able to analyze that, taking into account both general guidance and past experience to be able to identify uh, a morally defensible or morally sound course of action. That's sort of the aspiration of frenetic practice. And then how do we support people in the work that they're going to do from a frenetic perspective? Um, I'm going to say just four things. The first one is about policy. And the first thing to say about policy is, from what I just said about phrenesis, policy is never going to be enough. That we need to actually focus on people's moral judgment and supporting them in their moral judgment. But policy, of course, has a place. So there's the importance of developing coherent and relevant policies. When it comes to tragic choices, one of the things might be to identify recurrent sources of tragic choice. So we heard stories, for example, where there were issues of tragic choices that kept occurring, partly because it wasn't addressing the root cause, which might have been about staffing or equipping, which might have been um, in relation to who was available in terms of a particular decision or what was provided to specific teams. The second notion about policies is, well, what happens when teams in the field experience things if there's a, a policy response? One, uh, one aspect that comes across strongly is the gulf uh, often between field teams and headquarters, the people who might be making these decisions. And it's more than a geographic gulf, right? This distance uh, between the field and headquarters and policymaking 
So what's the possibility for establishing these feedback loops to be able to be responsive? Uh, there's a, an interesting idea, Samia Hurst and Mohan and Metzger talk about internal temlinage using the, the language of temlinage from NSF, but think what's the internal temlinage to speak up to and within the systems of a humanitarian organization? And then the second piece there uh, was about recognizing the limits of, of what policy can do. So this is the point I just made. Policies can't be created for all situations. Policies can't expunge all feelings of regret or address all these circumstances. So we need the, the, the judgment and the frenetic practice. The second piece, so that's like a policy response. The second piece is like, well, how do we support people maybe from a preparation perspective within organizations or training programs? Uh, and we often prepare people in ethics using cases, and they're sometimes pretty uh, cut and dry. You have a paragraph and you read it, and it's an abstract problem to try and solve. There's a place for casework. Um, and I think uh, what we might do if we really want to engage with tragic choice is look for opportunities to go beyond that. We've been thinking about, you know, are there other opportunities? Uh, sort of, we've been developing an e-module, for example, that's more of a choose your own adventure, where you have a series of choices, you're in a story, you're needing to respond to particular circumstances. What are the opportunities? Are there opportunities for simulation type training where people may be able to live these things out in some uh, way that might have more of an echo to real experience in terms of preparing and understanding? I think there's a lot to be said for narrative and for story. So not just the case that needs to be solved and thought through well. What about reading stories of people struggling to make difficult decisions in particular circumstances? And then lastly, and in the spirit of phrenesis, is thinking about mentorship and role modeling. So within, maybe in preparation, but then also in the field. Hugo Slim, who I mentioned is one of the most thoughtful people on this topic, really argues that humanitarians also should be looking for their role models amongst and within the communities with whom they work, that there are role models that they should seek out. Um, but what are the ways in which teams can be constituted that the newly arrived, that induction into a project Pairing people up with an experienced member of the, if it's an expatriate, maybe pairing them with a national staff member who will uh, serve in the role of mentor in all sorts of ways in terms of understanding, including understanding the ethical dimensions of practice. I, uh, I would just take a second to point you to our website, humanitarianhealthethics.net is a possible resource. There are a number of stories there, and uh, there might be an opportunity also of engaging with a community who's thinking about this topic if it's of interest to you. I mentioned uh, different levels, right? I talked about organizations, I talked about teams in the field. When we do these interviews with humanitarian health workers, we ask them, what's the important source of ethical support for you? The consistent answer is their colleagues. It's not uh, having codes of ethics. The most important thing for them in terms of getting their ethical bearings and experiencing support in challenging situations are the people with whom they work. And one of the most challenging, uh, you know, the flip side of that is if you're feeling isolated and in a team that's not functional, people will experience these challenges at just ratchet it up at this much greater level. So team relationships are a key source of support. Um, and then the question is, well, how can teams uh, also make and maintain moral space? Moral space is an idea from Margaret Urban Walker, a feminist philosopher thinking about spaces within organizations. But that might look like actually setting aside time in team meetings to ask questions about the ethical dimensions of what's going on. One of the challenges about the recurrent ethical issue is if you're always in a reaction mode, which is a natural way to be in the context of a crisis situation, is to keep bump, bumping up against the same tragic choice because there wasn't a, an opportunity to address it. So that might be directed towards looking at recurrent issues and seeking to address them and also supporting people in the challenges uh, that they face. There has uh, been a, something of a proposal to share the moral weight also of tragic choice. So the IDF group, in their response to the Haiti earthquake in 2010, they described that when they were making their uh, triage decisions, surgical triage decisions, they uh, identified opportunities actually that those decisions would always be made by several people together, that they would share the moral weight of those decisions. And then maybe there is a, sort of a, a continuation of that. An idea that's been put forward uh, by Philippe Calais is the idea of ethical debriefing. So we don't just think about debriefing in terms of like helping people readjust and uh, re-entry and the psychological dimensions, but there might be times and ways for debriefing also to address 
the ethical dimensions of what people have experienced. And then here's my last one. Uh, there's a place, uh, too, for creating tools that might be sort of heuristics that can help people. And I give the example here of work we did about the competency level, where uh, recognizing that there, there can be value in giving people points of reference. So on the left um, are a set of questions, essentially, to spark people's uh, reflection so that they come it's well considered, uh, have they thought about things that are important in this context, and then on the right actually was for a retrospective debriefing or a retrospective analysis. So the thing that we experienced already and now we have the time, that was an urgency. We couldn't uh, look at it carefully then. Uh, we just had to react. Well, there might still be an opportunity for examination of the situation. Um, so I think this uh, sort of tool can be supportive of frenetic practice in the sense that as I described before, it's the process of examining what might be morally important in a particular situation, uh, looking at how past experience, individual and collective, might be applied in the current situation, taking general guidance and looking how it might be applied in this particular circumstance, and then seeking to move forward and making a decision about how to respond. So those are four suggestions about uh, helping people in terms of tragic choices. And I'm going to uh, finish, this is a line from T.S. Eliot from The Hollow Men, uh, a piece of, you know, a little piece of poetry that John and I have been discussing. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. Um, and if you think back to that idea of cognitive dissonance that Alex DeWall introduced, that sometimes our ideals, when they are, we seek to apply them in a context that is itself unjust, we end up uh, in the situation where those ideals will be frustrated, but also we might end up in situations of doing things that feel cruel and that might be experienced as cruelties. Um, what is it about operating in those shadows? What is it about the tragic choices? And I think this might capture something that can happen in humanitarian uh, work, particularly in situations of crisis, is seeking how to navigate the shadows. I hope that the suggestions I've just made might be uh, helpful ones in that. And yet it's also recognizing the other thing that DeWall said, that some of these things are, we might, some of the individual tragic choices might be escapable, but tragic choices collectively are going to be inescapable and an inherent part of the humanitarian predicament. Um, and that's something that uh, needs to be grappled with uh, in terms of the experience and the response. And I will stop there. Um, I think we're going to have an opportunity for questions too. Uh, after this. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Hatch, for that informative and talk on both the dilemmas in humanitarian healthcare and the, comp the dilemmas of competency and patient selection processes and how we respond to those situations. So we virtually appreciate you coming here today. Um, now we are on to the panel. Um, so we have Dr. Elise Lubet. Uh, she is a medical anthropologist and assistant professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact. Her research in Latin America, Canada, and West Africa centers on social suffering, the politics of care, and the ethics and politics of global health research. And she's a core member of the Canadian Humanitarian Health Ethics Research Group. And we also have Dr. Don Pringle. Um, he is a nurse and epidemiologist with a PhD in public health and bioethics. He is vice chair of the MSF Ethics Review Board and a research associate with the Humanitarian Health Ethics Research Group. And John has done four missions with MSF, most recently in Sierra Leone during the Ebola crisis. And we also have Dr. here who's moderating the panel. So we have two different systems that are playing the same slide for the people who are online who can't see who's attached to my laptop. <laughs> um, so John's going to speak first, just to let you guys have, know how, let you guys know how this is going to go. John's going to uh, talk briefly about um, what he does for about five to ten minutes. Lisa will do the same, and then we'll have a kind of back and forth discussion with the audience following that. And you can ask questions to any of the three panelists or all three. So John. Sure. 
Well, thank you very much, and uh, and uh, thank you, Matthew. I really enjoyed the talk. It, it's nice to hear everything just uh, like just summated so nicely and uh, and so coherently. And and what's really challenging about this topic is that it is messy. It is complicated, um, and so trying to untangle it and make sense of it is 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 difficult, and it's even problematic. And it's going to raise a lot of critical questions that that we're not going to be answer, uh, able to answer, and collectively we're not going to be able to answer. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But just yeah, just to introduce myself a bit more, I, I did my nursing here at McMaster, so uh, this is kind of like a homecoming for me. Um, and I was, um, you know, before I, I went into my nursing here, I really wanted to do overseas work. I knew it was important. Uh, and that it was valuable. I love to travel. I mean, it was really selfishly motivated, right? I just wanted adventure and a good time. But I, I did a lot of backpacking. I saw that I saw extreme poverty. I saw what it looks like, how ugly and desperate it is. And coming home was really hard. I was just miserable uh, because you know so much of our society is just very superficial consumerism. And I couldn't get those images out of my head, and I knew I had to do something if I'm ever going to be, you know, have any sort of peace with myself. And so, um, so I, I did my my nursing here. I focused on global health. I did a practicum in southern Chile, working with uh, the the Mapuche indigenous population. It was very rewarding, and uh, so I went straight to the MSF office after graduation and said. Uh, I'm ready to go overseas. I got my stethoscope, and I'm ready to travel. And uh, to my dismay, they said, "John, look, you don't have really any experience. Go work for a couple of years and come back." And uh, and I was devastated. It's like I've got to work here. Um, but you know, I'm glad I did. Uh, I did um, northern nursing in First Nations communities. Uh, it was it was traumatizing to me. I was completely unprepared. It burnt me. It was a horrible experience. I recommend it to all of you. Um, and uh, uh, but you know, I, I saw the the nasty face of the Canadian state and its interface with with Aboriginal people, and it's just it's just shameful. And and Health Canada's treatment of uh, population health in First Nations was was just so dismal. And I I didn't feel like I was contributing. I was part of the problem, and I was the face of colonialism. And, uh, so when I came back to the Toronto MSF office, I was burnt out and frustrated, and I said, oh, now you're ready to go. <laughs> um, and so it was really rewarding. I, you know, working with MSF or Doctors Without Borders, it was a team approach. I always felt I was part of a team. Unlike being a, a, a lonely nurse in a fly-in nursing station in, with Health Canada, where I was completely by myself, um, I really felt like I was part of a team working for something greater. And it was really, really rewarding. But it leads, you know, these ethical challenges are insurmountable. They're an inherent part of this kind of work. And uh, and it asked me to, it made me leave with some really deep questions and um, and striving sort of for the bird's eye view that um, I studied uh, public health and epidemiology because it helped me make sense of disease outbreaks that I saw a lot of. Um, and then I, I did a PhD in, in public health and bioethics because that was really where the, the meaty questions can be answered. Um, and so I would just, um, after Matthew's talk, I think I, there's just a few points I, I want to make, just, just building on, on what Matthew said. I think, you know, when we discuss humanitarianism, in a lot of ways we can just view it kind of lightly, like it's... Uh, it's just like an overseas opportunity, something interesting to do. That it's, in some ways, it can be seen like a branch of medicine. Like you, in you can have pediatrics, you can have oncology, or you can have humanitarianism. Uh, and and it's with the professionalization of it, it's kind of become that way. And it's important that there is professionalization, um, but it's not everything. That uh, humanitarianism, we have to remember. It's a service of last resort. That that you know, there's there's horrible reasons why humanitarianism is needed in this world. It's not. It shouldn't be normal. Um, you know, it. Um, we should always approach it with a sense of, of anger 
and indignation that the world and humanity requires humanitarianism. It's, it's, let's not make it normal. Let's not treat it as though it's just an opportunity. It looks great on the resume. It's exciting. You come home and tell your friends some interesting stories. It's really, uh, it's really, it's, it's made up of nightmares is what it is. And the other point I want to make is that it's highly inadequate. It is going to be forever not enough. And that humanity, the amount of need in the world um, is not being addressed by humanitarianism. We get the sense that it is because, you know, there's so many NGOs. Uh, a lot of the fundraising campaigns give the impression that the need is there, all we need is the money and we'll solve these problems. And it's not true. That humanitarianism is scattered like confetti around the world uh, and, uh, and it's in, in no real systematic way and it's, it's never going to be enough. So I think that, um, that we have to remember that there should always be a level of angst and anger. Humanitarianism provides opportunity, it provides a source, a way to bring social justice through uh, help for all, um, but it is never going to be enough. It's always going to be insufficient and it should never be required. It is a result of the political failures and the economic injustice in this world and that these ethical challenges are just a small, um, are just a small manifestation of these larger uh, Injustices. Uh, so maybe I'll just stop there. All right. Thanks. So hello everybody. Um, I'm Elise Nube, and I'm um, a assistant professor here at McMaster, as well in the health evidence and impact and methodology. Sorry, the title has just changed. <laughs> <laughs> the newly named department of C and B. Um, and my background is in anthropology and uh, social and medical anthropology specifically, with an interest in social determinants of health and illness, but also the ways in which the distribution of disease, um, distress, uh, and life and death are unequally distributed across the globe and within societies. Um, so I'm, I'm coming to this discussion from a, an outsider perspective to the practice of humanitarian healthcare. I was drawn to it uh, following my PhD, working in, um, in a poor neighborhood in Nicaragua and seeing that there was very um, different usages and accessing of short-term medical missions, which made me interested in medical humanitarianism. I found uh, this great group, Humanitarian Healthcare Ethics, and began work with uh, Dr. Schwartz um, to look at, you know, why, first of all, what were the kind of the politics and experiences of people on the ground accessing these services, as well as um, the national healthcare providers in Central America um, in working either in partnership or in witnessing the arrival and departure of these various medical missions. Um, I think that one of the things that um, has kind of struck me as it, it, there has been this growing recognition within humanitarian healthcare, which was a new field for me um, six years ago, uh, is that there is this growing movement to acknowledge and, and pay attention to local experiences. And it kind of has emerged out of you know, issues of the safety of humanitarian healthcare organizations, a sense that, a realization that you know, these are political, but also physical realities that can't be denied. Um, the way in which your organization is seen and their actions are interpreted. What are the motivations behind it? Um, so that's uh, some of the things that have been interesting uh, me the most in terms of these ethics uh, is kind of questioning and always kind of trying to see, you know, there are these definitions of, of doing good or of desirable or ideal action in humanitarian health care that might, that there are diverse and um, parallel definitions of doing good that coexist within any humanitarian healthcare space and within humanitarian healthcare transactions. So that, you know, what one person feels is the right thing to do might feel very wrong, might feel very normal to other people within that same space and within that same care transaction. Um, so that also is such a big uh, component for me in listening to Matthew's talk about tragic choices, um, having just 
been involved in some interviews about palliative care and humanitarian health care, you know, this uh, sense of what might be extremely traumatic to a Canadian healthcare responder um, can actually be at least seen by them as um, being very normal within the context in which they're providing care because of this um, unfortunately normalized dying of patients, losing of patients, this normalized um, lack of resources. Um, so what do we do with that? Um, that's it. <laughs> All right, so we can open up the floor to you guys. Um, does anyone have any immediate questions that they want to ask? to make sure you can tell me if I get it right or wrong in terms of reiterating the question. Uh, the, the main concern is what happens in a circumstance within a humanitarian organization where someone has acted in a way, perhaps deviating from policy or acted based on a sense of compassion or otherwise, um, and there's been some sort of reprimand. There's been some sort of sanction against them. You're suggesting maybe suspended, for example. And then what is it in terms of people rallying around them or the sense of community? Um, it's a really interesting uh, question, and when I'm thinking about the examples of all the stories, I don't, uh, I can't point to any uh, interviewee telling a story that quite shaped up like that, but I can imagine it happening. I think what might be suggested is actually to go to this idea of teamwork or how that might work, uh, what that might look like. Uh, there certainly are situations where there are teams where people uh, rally together, as you described. Um, and sometimes face decisions or make these decisions together. Like I, I, I was suggesting uh, sharing the moral weight uh, in that sort of circumstances if it's the, the team that's come to a collective decision as opposed to a, one individual within the team who's made a decision, it might be a very different experience of one it might be all of us together. Given the fact that we're the ones here and you're far away, we had this general policy and we uh, had to think about its applicability in this context. The flip side of that is there should be accountability for decisions that people make. We should be able to articulate why we've done something, and especially in a circumstance where there's some established uh, protocol or guideline based on experience in other contexts. The flip of that is we have to be able to give a reasoned explanation. Um, so I think there's two sides to the story, but maybe a lot of it comes down to uh, teams and the nature of teams, and what might a sense of solidarity be in terms of teamwork. I, I've heard people describe this sort of circumstance, suddenly you're with a group of people, you live in the same house, you share every meal with them, you're there, maybe you're working six days a week together, you're sharing your entire, you know, you're our, like, lie down in traffic for each other type of relationships if the team is working as it often does. John was just describing uh, teams and the importance of teams and that sense of um, camaraderie and something maybe even beyond that. So I think that's what I've heard more. What's really, really hard are the stories where people feel like they're not part of a team that can do those things. And I can imagine that sort of circumstance, and that's an ethical challenge in and of itself. I don't know, does, uh, maybe there's some things that people would want to add, but does that sort of get to some of the concern that you're raising? Yeah. 
And that's, you know, any healthcare team or any team might experience this sort of thing, right? Just that we might imagine sort of amplified uh, in the context of humanitarianism in terms of what's at stake. But I, I do teaching in sort of the clinical context in Montreal, and uh, I talk about the ethics of teamwork. And these are the sorts of things that happen. What makes it for a team that's actually, we talk about individuals being good at making ethical decisions. What makes a team good at this? You know, that they've done some sort of self-examination as individuals of what they think are their core commitments. What Do they have a shared vocabulary for talking about ethical issues? In the rhythms of their team, have they made moral spaces where they can have these? All those things might help them, um, and yet there'll be situations where they disagree or their moral compass uh, points two degrees to the right or two degrees to the left. How do they reconcile that for group action? Yeah, thank you. Well, I have a question, and it's not an aggressive question, but probably it will sound like it, but it's just because I don't know how to place it. But um, my question is because when I was hearing John, I was like, oh, I totally identify with you. So sometimes I ask myself that question about ethics. Like, is there a place for ethics in humanitarian aid? And I know that this talk is about that, but sometimes I say, like, is it going to help you soothe the pain? Will it help you sleep at night? Will it do something for you because I mean I am sometimes hearing these stories and I I can tell you exactly what people are on the other side of the sea if I was in this Dante Alighieri story of the hell and then you're crossing the hell and then all your victims because you see them as victims of you so the question is like is there a place for ethics will it help me H how will it help me how will it help us because a lot of people in this room are working the same stuff that we are working in. So, is there a place? What will it do? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry, it sounds horrible, but I think it's like. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in because I see a connection to the previous question as well um, in terms of, you know, is there. Uh, it, this is again coming out of this uh, recently started project about palliative care in humanitarian crises um, and just kind of the gratitude and hope for some kind of guidelines because of those super high stress situations where um, your own ethical compass is not clear. You're under so much pressure. Um, it's very difficult to decide where to draw the line uh, between you know, helping somebody who has a few days left or redirecting resources to somebody else. Um, so there's kind of a, I think that one of the places for ethics anyways comes back to this idea of, of policies, whether they be guidelines for best practice in very diverse situations, um, but as well, you know, maybe a normalization of ethical debriefing. I really like that idea of ethical debriefing because it's not just about preparedness and it's not just about policies. and it does come to uh, to the team dynamics. That's really important to us as well. But if there was ethical debriefing where you could try to figure out what happened, um, that is a place for ethical thinking. And that seems extremely important in terms of always trying to improve practice and deliver care that um, is at its best in those conditions. I might just add that, you know, there's it's there's always the ethical challenges and just sometimes we're not aware that it's an underlying issue and it rips teams apart um, people aren't getting along they're backstabbing they're forming cliques and uh, and so sometimes it, it's manifest really unhealthily and so when you boil it down you see well okay there's an underlying ethical issue that we need to deal with so sometimes it's better just to be explicit about it because it's happening anyway um, rather than to just let it fester, and which, which it does often happen. But, you know, let's, uh, let's bring it up. Let's get our, uh, you know, we all have um, sort of uh, biases and misconceptions about things. And so let's talk honestly in, in this moral safe space. And, um, so I think there's a lot of value to it. Maybe I'll, I'll layer in one piece. I think you could take, if you had a 
you know, you could dial in your microscope, right, and dial it out. You could talk about, you play with the conjunctions. You could talk about ethics for humanitarian action, which might be the macro level things that John was talking about. You could dial it in and you could talk about ethics of humanitarian action, so a different conjunction. There might be questions about, like, that confetti, or why is more humanitarian action going over here or not, or the way it intersects with foreign policy. And then you could dial it in and we could ask ethical questions about ethics in humanitarian action, which is what we we're talking about today. So I think the ethics lens, uh, we just adjust that gaze, uh, or I'll keep the metaphor, we dial in the microscope or dial it out, we're going to be able to examine these uh, layers at which there might be ethically important things going on and hopefully be able to um, better orient what we're doing in terms of responding to people's needs, in terms of trying to figure out, well, what's the best thing to do in this circumstance? I'm actually going to ask a question from James Smith in Geneva. Um, so, driven in recent years by donors seeking value for money, um, there is a strong <coughs> ethical, but there is a strong ethical dimension here. Some of the examples of decision making quoted here as a con has a consequential consequentialist dimension, yet without evidence or experience, it's difficult to judge consequence. Did respondents quote an organization's commitment to research or as a long or to research as a long term remedy to ethical, ethical challenges? Uh, well, that's a loaded question. So thank you, James. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I, I'm not going. I'm not sure if I'm going to nail this question, but. Um, I think what we're seeing, it brings up the, the, uh, the topic of research in the humanitarian context, and that's, that was part of our, our goal today. So I uh, appreciate the question, and, and um, you know, research has a, has a form of legitimacy. It, it provides evidence, and for many years, I can, I can talk about uh, MSF, or Doctors Without Borders, uh, a lot of... Um, a lot of our témoignage or advocacy was based on anecdote and, and voices from the field. And they were powerful voices, they were moving voices, and it really was, um, it, it carried a lot of weight and exposed a lot of things. But to uh, voices, unfortunately, in this political climate are often easily discounted and non believed so it um, so research provides a form of legitimacy, particularly qualitative research, and we're seeing a surge in qualitative research and anthropological research in humanitarian context. And I think it is very important. Um, it's in some ways it's it's sad that it, we require that form of methodology to make voices legitimate, but um, but it's true. And so we're doing more and more qualitative research, and as with any research, it needs to be done properly. So not just anybody can do, can call themselves a qualitative research. There are certain skills involved and methodologies. So this is becoming um, an in-house skill within humanitarian organizations, and it, uh, it is not just operational research, not just deciding uh, how well our projects are going and what we should be doing next, but to inform advocacy and to shout out to the world and say, listen to these voices, this is what is happening and this is unacceptable. Right, just to add to that very briefly, I think it's particularly important because of the um, rise in kind of affect-centered politics of humanitarianism where, you know, there's this directing of where you give your money or recruit or trying to mobilize resources and humanitarianism often works through this very emotional, you know, heartstring pulling um, emotion and within a context where people can be swayed to care or not care about people based on unreasoned empathy often um, you know then it becomes all the more important to have a parallel movement of research that's kind of trying to somewhat more objectively figure out what is going on on the ground what's needed who needs it who's being excluded who's invisible in those geographies of care mm -hmm. Yeah. 
conjunction with our own philosophies of development. And that has a very different equitable framework in which it operates. How much of this presents problems for healthcare advocates? And how much are both systems caught up in a kind of ethical PTSD? Because that's what's been described in right now, is the perfect setup to be a humanitarian workers PTSD. Give them a situation that you cannot resolve and at least two reasonable options that won't work. Right. That they have to choose between. Can you comment about this conflict of ethical systems and how do we begin to think about that? Uh, so I th yeah, th thank you for the question. Um, I'll try and start down that road. I think it would, it would be worth sort of acknowledging too that there might be many more ethical systems. That's a good example. But even just like if we're thinking of Western healthcare ethics, we you know there, there's so many things in humanitarian work which aren't about individual patients but are more the collective, right? So the population health concerns. There was a, an MSF document at one point was stated that we. Uh, address the health of populations one patient at a time. And I think that covered, so what about public health ethics and how does that intersect with clinical ethics? And we see these sorts of tensions. We did a project actually around, uh, based on interviews with healthcare professionals working with the Canadian military deployed internationally, many of whom were deployed to Afghanistan, but not exclusively so. We interviewed about 50 people from med techs who were in the field, medical technicians to physicians and surgeons. Um, and it was very interesting to examine some of those questions. They are in uh, sort of, the, you know, they're trying to reconcile and live out and be consistent with uh, the ethical system of being both healer and soldier, um, and and also in the context of, you know, it, it's going to be very different in the context of a humanitarian emergency versus a war in which they are associated with a military that's actively involved in that military conflict. Um, there's that potential for sort of dual loyalties and trying to uphold multiple standards. And there clearly is this sort of tension there. What I would say very interestingly in those interviews and in that research um, with the Canadian health professionals that we were talking to, when the at the bottom line, their uh, commitments as a health professional um, was where they came to in terms of their sense of core obligations in, in many instances. And yet thinking about, well, how does that work in the chain of command? And how does that work? There was this other description of, you know, for the mission in the context of this sort of activity. So I think uh, it does strike to some of the challenges where we're being multiple things. And it doesn't just have to be that. Like, there's a scaffolding for humanitarian ethics around neutrality and independence and impartiality. And that might be a different sort of thing that's operating than, than healthcare ethics. Um, and there are different, there are multiple healthcare ethics ethics is that are going on too, right? So th that sort of uh, context is going to be um, the case, not just for the military health professional deployed internationally. Um, but thank you for raising it. And I think it is the sort, uh, you know, just sort of one more layer to the types of challenge we're talking about. And it can be uh, the source of moral distress or PTSD, as you describe it, that residue that people might carry with them might be uh, also associated in some ways with having trying to live up to multiple sets of commitments when they can't be easily reconciled or they see them as conflicting. And you don't even have to be within different types of frameworks within the sort of commitments that you have. That was the quote from DeWall, right? One of the tragedies was about these conflicting values that couldn't be held together always. So uh, maybe I can restate it and then see who wants to jump in. So you're asking specifically about sort of a humanitarian project, not a research project, no, no, no. and whether there should be some. Yeah. Right. 
then they approve that for research. But when we are going to do a project or any humanitarian action in another country, like for example, like bring a technology to uh, like a country, a country okay. in, like in Africa. So like how we are going to be sure that that, that technology will help the population? Is there any like to like board and things like that approve that like with part of that? Because like it's a, um, like lots of money they will put to just like a board. And um, lots of things, and like to, it should be helpful to that community, not something that like hurt that community more. Because like sometimes, like um, it was like I was reading about the technology that was in one country, and it actually kills uh, lots of the work that they, that they were doing. So they were more unemployed in that country instead of like being more like happier uh, and being like wealthier than before. That that technology will help. So like, um, how like, right. how we can be sure that like when we are doing something to help another country is really helping them instead of like hurting them. Right. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. can I just add that question because I have the same question. Maybe you can address all in one go. It's the same. I had that question with John. You were speaking earlier. There, there seems to be a lot of push now, and you said it, John, yourself, but in-house organizations like MSF have been so involved in the research. And I'm curious how much. Why is it that in the academic world we're very much held accountable for high level of, uh, you know, ethical research and being holding up our standards to quantitative or qualitative research? But when it comes to in-house organizations, whether it's MSF Switzerland, who conducts a lot of research on reflection from the field with very little ethical approval in the background, it further addresses the other speaker's question. <laughs> How much did actually? I'm curious to know from the three people that are sitting in the front. Are, are and I know that all of you are affiliated with academic institutions. How much of a call has been has been there from academic institutions to organizations like MSF telling you that get your approval, your ethical approval and order in check so that we ensure that if we're holding people in academia to a high level of standard, why are they not being held to exact same standards? Let me ask you guys to distill the question really quick and forget for the people who are listening online. Sure, sure. So so the question is, is about uh, uh, sort of ethics scrutiny and approval for not just projects and uh, but research as well so so is there some sort of system set up for this uh, and the I guess the answer is yes and no um, so it is a bit of a wild west out there and there are uh, thousands of well-meaning NGOs that can plant a flag uh, in humanitarian crises all over the place and there's lots of duplication and failed efforts and uh, we saw this particularly with Haiti after the, the earthquake, how problematic that is of every well-meaning uh, Western uh, NGO or church group wanting to rush in and, and uh, be the great white savior trope. And, um, and this, is, this is wrong. And this has been an issue that has, the humanitarian sector has been trying to address for decades. And it's getting better at it. There, um, there, uh, there are... Um, organization like the UN cluster system to sort of coordinate humanitarian responses. So let's first of all differentiate developmental developmentalism from humanitarianism. So you know, introducing new technologies to try to improve quality of life that kind of sounds more of a developmental project uh, that may be separate from an emergency response of a humanitarian organization. So in humanitarian aid work, there. There's a lot of uh, knowledge base about best practices, and we have the sphere, sphere standards. We know uh, the you know refugee health uh, has become a, a, a well studied area of, of healthcare. So there there is evidence to act on. It should be acted on. Um, in reality, NGOs can't just storm into countries. They have functioning governments usually. You need to have a, um, a memorandum of understanding with the local Ministry of Health in order to do a project. That Ministry of Health will tell you exactly what you can do and what you cannot do. Uh, it has to jive with their own projects, um, and if you fall outside of that, you're going to get into trouble. And it would ideally be coordinated with other projects. So there is a semblance of organization, uh, not so much in the acute emergency phase when governments are, are, aren't functioning or actually belligerents against their own populations. Um, but it is still a little bit of a wild west. 
uh, in terms of research, we've come a long way, I think. And if you look at um, uh, taking the example for Médecins Sans Frontières, you have two board members on the research ethics board right here. So uh, we do uh, ethics, and we're in, we're sort of arm's length from MSF, so we're an independent board, and we scrutinize these projects, and we're we really scrutinize them. Uh, because we know that they're working with research on highly vulnerable populations. Not only that, we stipulate that they need to get research ethics approval in country. So if they're doing research in Sierra Leone, there's an ethics review board there that needs to review this protocol as well. And if they're if it's being funded out of McMaster, it's going to go through the McMaster Research Ethics Board as well. So uh, you know the standards are high because of lessons learned over the years. Of, there have been horrible abuses of well-meaning individuals. We've learned our lessons. We're trying to make things better. But it's still a free-for-all because, well, the world is a free-for-all. And so we can only try to act as ethically and for our own behaviors, but we can't always control those of others. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a question down that has a lot of links to it. I'll try and hear it back. Uh, you talked about a lot of remedies. Um, Support colleagues, moral spaces, share the moral weight, debriefing. And I was asking myself, so then, what if, if those are the remedies, what was the goal? Is it to reduce? Um, is it to reduce um, regret of decision making, or is it to reduce uh, suffering? Is it to reduce death? Um, and if those are the objectives, um, what would be the role of religion, in your opinion? as a, a source of coherence in um, trying to reconcile all the disparate value systems between utilitarianism, least harm, greatest good, or deontological ethical decision-making systems that um, hold uh, um, agency or um, autonomy as a high value. Um, because many religions talk about suffering and death as an inevitable part of life on the planet. Uh, by the way, I consider living in this current time to be quite tragic in and of itself. Uh, <laughs> so, is there any route out of out of these inevitabilities? And is there a role for religion in helping um, teams or individuals to reconcile um, these tensions? Mm. Very interesting question. I'll rephrase, and then again, we can see who's going to jump in. So, the question is a, partly about the. You know, the, the last part of the talk, we were talking about these four ways or four big categories in which I was thinking about, well, how might we respond? Um, you know, they're not things that are going to resolve these. They're irresolvable, these sorts of ethical challenges I was describing. But what's the goal? Are we after just minimizing people's distress that they're going to feel? Is it about making uh, the best decision possible in this circumstance? Is it about reducing suffering for the people who are, you know, affected by these decisions? Is it about reducing death? Um, and then the second part was about, well, what's the role that religion might play, uh, thinking about these different ethical approaches that we've described, and how might that work for teams or for individuals in different contexts. Um, is that fair? Excellent. I'm really impressed. <laughs> okay. He's good. Uh, so I'll start in, and then we'll see what my uh, colleagues and friends will be able to do to help us. So I, mean, I, I would say, what was, what's the goal of the response? Hopefully it's to do many of those things. Um, you know, it, it would be, uh, I think, uh, important while we acknowledge the inescapable nature of tragic choices as a category, um, some of the things I'm suggesting is to head off tragic choices before they happen, identify the recurrent issues, do better, and make improvements that some of those remedies might help. Some of them are to prepare people so that they'll be able to respond and also to not be so, sort of like, totally confronted by, as this is something I've never conceived of before, this sort of least worst option. Um, help people that they can do better in these circumstances. Uh, with the primary goal, why are we there? It's to address, like, what's the purpose of humanitarianism? Save lives, to alleviate suffering, to promote dignity. Um, and so with those as the goals, hopefully all of those interventions can help in support of that. And it's really interesting to think about, well, what are the, uh, just from thinking about, like, what are the resources that we might bring to it? And a covenantal sort of approach to ethics, whatever sort of religious tradition, are hugely important for many people, and sometimes there are faith-based organizations where people might share the same faith tradition and see that as a resource. It may or may not be the same 
uh, religious tradition that is um, within a community, and there might be many religious traditions. So I think we need to, uh, actually to uh, approach all of this, including our discussion of ethics with humility. Um, and humility in terms of seeing, well, what are the wide range of ethical resources that might come from religious traditions, from philosophic traditions, and see those. I'm, I'm a pluralist when it comes to ethics in the sense that, uh, you know, if the object that I'm trying to understand, uh, you know, if I have different flashlights, uh, you know, I'm illuminating the object here, this ethical challenge here, and I'm holding the flashlight of consequentialism, it's going to show me just one side of it, and something else is going to be in shadow. Um, and over here, well, humanitarian principles might show me something different. And there, there'll be for people and for groups and for instances where religious traditions will also show uh, things that are important and come into, and, and, and they'll cast shadows. There'll be things that'll be uh, not revealed by those traditions. So uh, if we see all these things as resources, I think we'll be better off collectively. And if our spirit approaching this is one of humility, we will also be better uh, ready not to think that we have all the answers, not to impose our own tradition, our own background, but to approach it with the humility. Maybe this gets to the issue of teamwork, too, that we're going to be better able to work together. Um, so if I was talking about a moral posture, um, the moral posture, you know, central aspect of that would be uh, the introspection and the reflexivity to examine where, why I'm reacting to an issue in a particular way, why do I think this is the right thing to do, and then the humility to be able to listen and to understand that other people might reasonably have other views. I'll, yeah, I'll add a little bit um, as well. I mean, I think that one of the things, a few things come to mind, and one is that um, there is, and it's been written about by people like Michael Barnett, that some people, you know, are involved as atheists in humanitarianism, but really adopted in the form of a um, fundamentalist faith. Um, so the where the principles of neutrality, uh, for example, or of doing good become, you know, their definition of their identity in a way that is very similar to religious identities. And another fa facet is that so many NGOs that are doing humanitarian healthcare are religious in nature. And therefore, there is absolutely that kind of ethical framework coexisting within humanitarian healthcare space very, very often, whether it's coming from an organization or from individuals' point of departure. And then there's the history of humanitarianism that's founded in, um, in like European humanitarian action um, that is at the core of like the ICRC has a Christian root and it's about alleviating suffering and it's about recognizing the suffering of your fellow human being and that one-on-one -on -one relationship, which does seem to have um, come, um, there's been a shift perhaps uh, with uh, you know, the rise of magic bullets in science and the fact that there's so many technologies available. Some humanitarian um, scholars are kind of suggesting that maybe we've lost touch with the one-on-one -on -one goal of humanitarianism of responding to recognizing and alleviating suffering as we try to just save lives or cure. Um, that's one facet, but there's that whole other facet that is a very, um, if it's not spiritual, it could still be about the human relationship, depending on where your point of departure is. Well, I'm just wondering, uh, kind of building on that, where you, how humanitarian workers draw, or you begin to think about drawing a line between uh, evidence-based medicine and the, the Western world deems as uh, top priority versus mm -hmm. if you're in a Area and they have certain religious beliefs. I think mostly of in the evil academic um, burying the dead and how you couldn't touch the dead because they still had gold on them, but they wanted to bury the dead. And so, how do you settle the order? How, what's mm -hmm. the responsibility of the humanitarian organization for yeah. mediating kind of Ebola versus kind of their mental distress and trust within? Yeah. But uh, that's a you know Ebola is always an extreme example, and um, the, you know the worst time to do that sort of thing is in a in a in a acute crisis such as Ebola. It was so that's why it was like that contributed yeah, to the to the mess. And um, but you know over time we did work that out. There was uh, you know it was it was thought that in, at the the peak of the crisis that there wasn't room for community engagement. 
and that was a huge mistake. That the, we're going to store them in this, this biomedical Western approach, and then we'll worry about those things later. And that that tack didn't work. It backfired, and uh, lessons were learned. And and um, so there there was uh, you know with the with the case of um, safe burials. Okay, well, what is it about? Um, about the, the burial ritual that is most important and how can we how can we incorporate that and do it in a safe way and, and we worked this out over time um, and with the help of uh, medical anthropologists played a huge role in that and um, so there were some lessons learned but you know people around the world know what good health care is and they want good health care so we often fixate on all these cultural differences, mm -hmm. but the fact is um, people have infections, they want antibiotics to cure it, and, and uh, so, you know, let's get these things out there first and then worry about uh, all the subtleties and nuance, um, but the fact is, you know, if healthcare really is a human right, then we're, we still got a long way to go. Um, we actually have a question from Philip Gallet who I believe you spoke about in your uh, talk, and he's, uh, with regards to tragic choices, he asks, whose choices? Um, when is it ethical to transfer or share the burdens of a tragic choice with those who are the recipients of that very risky aid, quote-unquote? Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, Philip, uh, for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, strikes to the heart of uh, one part of the predicament. Um, and so the natural, you know, the sort of one sort of response is, well, uh, of course, you know, who should be involved in making decisions? It's the people who are going to be most affected by the decisions, uh, and those are the people who uh, may or may not receive care. Um, and yet that doesn't seem to match uh, in many instances what seems possible, especially these decisions about um, allocating resources or triage type decisions. But there might be other ways of involving communities. And so one example, um, again, a narrative from a, an interview with someone talking about the great struggle that they had working with a community where they came in with their mandate where they were prioritizing children under the age of five. And the community was saying, well, what's more important to us are our elders. Uh, and so all the guidelines and everything was focused on alleviating and addressing the needs of children under five, and they were struggling. Well, what, what place then should we reassess in light of not just this individual choice, but there's this bigger issue there about allocation and prioritization. And I think maybe uh, it's not doesn't map perfectly onto the tragic choices that we were talking about before, but it might start to get at the maybe the question behind the question too, is like how might we look for ways to do to be more collaborative as well as humble uh, with communities who are the ones most clearly affected by these types of decisions. I don't know if you have things John or Ellie say to add to that. That's a just. It does just make me think of, um, and I do think that collaboration and kind of think, always taking that the culturally sensitive um, approach and collaborative approaches, right? But it does strike me as a question that we face in um, Canadian healthcare as well, um, and so kind of universally in healthcare, when there is a tragic choice for a family, like pulling the plug on somebody who's on life support. Um, and there's this dilemma that um, medical staff face as well in terms of, you know, is it really ethical to have this patient shared decision making? Like when does shared decision making become an additional huge source of moral distress? Um, and so do we want to just, we, we can't export um, internationally issues we haven't or approaches we haven't even figured out at home, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, so it's it's yet to be sorted out what the best approach is, but in general, you know, we want humanitarian healthcare to be locally appropriate, and that's not defined yet. So I had actually gone on a medical mission trip four years ago in Nicaragua, oh. and I had gotten people telling me to my face like going on this type of trip is not ethical, and it's something I, I really like, thought about and reflected on after, but how do you know what to look for when you're doing humanitarian efforts globally? Like, what, are you doing more harm than good? And how do you know 
that. And I think it's a really hard thing to figure out like uh, when you look for an organization. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just say something very quickly because um, I think with your field experience, you'll be able to maybe answer that. Um, one of the things with short-term uh, medical missions is that many get qualified as short-term medical missions because they do last seven days or ten days. But in fact, they're going back to the same hospital, you know, 20 times in the same year to do a certain amount of, uh, to do general surgeries, uh, for example. And so in those cases, it is almost becoming, you know, it, it is not really a short-term mission. I think that kind of sustained engagement that usually comes with partnerships, um, good collaboration with local healthcare providers is a good indication, uh, would be one of the things to, to look for. But that's from my limited experience uh, with short-term medical mission work. Um, and I guess the question can always ask yourself, is are we perpetuating uh, a patriarchal neocolonial system? And and we just benefiting ourselves, um, and and uh, and you know humanitarianism doesn't just happen in the field. I think we also have responsibilities uh, as individuals to be active politically, uh, particularly with um, you know the rise of Trumpism and uh, neo-fascism around the world. That uh, our responsibilities are only to to speak out and be active and show up at demos and write letters and call your political. Uh, leaders and uh, and make a statement and talk, <coughs> because you know th their emancipation is part of our emancipation. We're all in the same struggle, and so you know ask these critical questions and and uh, you know the answers are going to be difficult. And I know for myself as a very privileged you know white middle class male from Canada. I mean, and this is a you know reflects the question that Philip asks about the power imbalances that are just inherent. We'll never get away from that, but we can we can sort of be allies in the struggle. Thank you. I'd like to continue that because I actually have a question that would go to additional expectations from that because in that report that you mentioned the assistance of private sources and also the joint report about the fact that the military action shouldn't be normal. And I read several years ago an article that was should epidemiologists be involved with or actually worry about the concerns of the poverty because it's one of these disorders of health. And my question is, what are humanitarian organizations that we should they be doing anything? And if so, what are they doing to try and avoid some of these tragic circumstances, tragic choices that you're talking about, especially from the resource allocation equity perspective? Going to restate it, and then uh... Uh, yeah. So the question is, uh, so are humanitarian involvement, uh, humanitarian organizations, and epidemiology is their responsibility to uh, to attack um, poverty? I say we would attack cholera or malnutrition, and um, the answer is mixed. We don't know. Um, I say yes. Others say no. Uh, we don't want to get into politics and humanitarian organization because that infringes on our neutrality. Uh, this is a difficult question, and uh, so and it's one that is constantly being asked. So, um, you know, make your voice heard and be part of the discussion because we really don't know. So, Philip has responded and says, "Thanks for the answers." And it's not only a matter of community, but also of individuals. Uh, for example, uh, if you need to say you need to an amputation to survive, I've never done that before, but I think I can try to do it. What would you prefer? And I know. Um, both Matthew and John, you were we were speaking earlier about um, things, uh, experiences in the field where you had had to do something that you felt um, was beyond your scope of practice, and that experience. So I was wondering if you could share some of those and how you personally dealt with uh, the ethical dilemma of doing something that you wouldn't do at home. Um, well, at home, you see, now that's complicated because I was a nurse in nursing stations where I experienced just that at home, technically, um, where, you know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, you can't get a, a medevac out because of the weather, and, uh, you know, you're being called upon to do things that make you really uncomfortable. And, and our, you know, our research data covers this, and there's, there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, you're making a decision at the time, and uh, I know personally you, you tend to downplay, you don't want to get people anxious. 
um, because you know they're they're already anxious, and so uh, you have to sort of suppress your own anxiety and, and do the best you can. Um, but empirically, what was uh, what are some of the the data? Well, yeah, maybe I've, well, I'll just return back to Philip's point. Philip's point is uh, excellent. I might get to the distinction between the two types of dilemmas I talked about. The de dilemma of patient selection is different in that instance than the dilemma of competency, where that seems uh, right. Um, and th there might also be other layers of concern there, even ones of security, in terms of what other people might perceive if humanitarian organizations are practicing amputation when they haven't uh, don't have the, the experience of doing it. So there might be other layers to it, but I, I really take that point. I think that's uh, right. Um, well, I, I mean, there's one thing that the data says. I mean, I think there are different types of these issues related to actually one of the characteristics of the someone involved in sort of international uh, global health work or humanitarian work will be a certain degree of adaptability and the ability, you know, the ability and the willingness also to try things that they haven't done before. Like it would be a total cop-out to imagine that you're going to be only doing things um, that you've done before. My experience is totally uh, modest in comparison. It's just like being a physiotherapist in the context of in a country where there was no orthotist I could refer to and there was no occupational therapist. And so I don't think it's uh, problematic in any way that suddenly I had to be the one adjusting splints for children where I would have just called someone. Or when it came to building a molded uh, seat for a child with a severe disability, it was like, you know, a uh, plaster to be able to build something to form and then going to the carpenter, the local carpenter to help build. So one of the, after my first experience internationally was coming home to Montreal and suddenly realizing like all my colleagues at the hospital that I had to watch over their shoulder to learn some stuff from them because that's the sort of things that internationally where those other professions didn't exist, I had to do those things. Now those weren't life and death decisions. Those weren't the sorts of things that were described in the examples that I gave. Um, but those, you know, I think that there's, there's that whole array and then it's distinguishing within that, well, what are the true competency dilemmas where we're thinking about not just sort of um, needing to expand my capacities to do uh, what people need in this context. Um, and maybe working in the north is a good analogy where that just needs, the circle needs to widen. And if we were uh, here at the hospital here at McMaster, if John practiced the way he did in the north, he would be, he would be doing a wrong thing and partly because of those expectations. But where the other people don't exist, the expectations might change. There seems to also be an aspect there of, of the risk and benefits being discussed with the patient question and how core that is to, to ethical practice, right? In healthcare, I mean, that's somebody's going to have their leg amputated, classic case in Haiti, uh, after the earthquake where not only were people not qualified to do amputations, there were no painkillers in many cases, and some when they recovered, those that did recover, which wasn't all of them, you know, said they would have rather died. Um, so I think that um, given that there's no supports for uh, individuals with, with severe disabilities in the Haitian context. Um, so I think that that communication is actually a really huge part of ethics that maybe is part of the answer there. Uh, yeah, it's, just, it's been addressed, yeah. Um, okay, well, I think uh, we're coming to the close of the hour, so unless anyone has anything else to share. Oh, yeah. Um, I was interested in one of the dilemmas you presented. I mean, I could um, say, okay, with $100, I could save four lives or one life. And it's still a no brain. Example you presented where they had to turn the kid away and for, and said I can do bit more with these resources. That still created a dilemma. And mm -hmm. at one level it should have been a no way I can save more lives. But as human beings we just don't think like that. You know, if I have a kid right in front of me and I've got to say, you know, I'm gonna you know, you're not you're not gonna get treated because others we're going to do better with others. Mm -hmm. So where does all that fit in? I mean, um, you know, they actually had some discussion of some of these issues on the, the current mm -hmm. um, over the last while the CDC program, 
where they had someone talking with this wrote a book called Against Empathy, essentially about uh, effective altruism. Yes. Um, and then they got a guy, Paul Swobich, who looks at decisions. And he was saying, again, that's not how we make decisions. In fact, we we'll do more for one person than we would for two. Uh, you know, and again, there's a Stalin quote here, you know, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. <laughs> so, yeah. why, you know, what, where does all this fit in? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure I've got a real question here, but yeah. I'm just throwing it out. Okay, so to restate quickly, um, pointing to uh, that, that specific dilemma where the person was describing the patient before her versus some um, future patients who will come, and the, she, the hypothetical idea that she could, by saving those resources uh, and not transferring the patient now, that she would be able to help these people, and they'll get better. Um, so there'll be better outcomes for more people if she waits. And I think you're right that the emotional aspect of it, the compassion of the seeing the person in front of her versus the people who haven't come yet and she doesn't know them. She's been interacting. This is a patient that she's been caring for. I think it does capture something about who we are as people, who we are as health professionals. Um, and so, yeah, if you if you looked at it just as a case to be solved on paper, that's going to be very different than the tragic choice that people might experience in the field. There are other stories like this that we heard, people saying there's one oxygen machine, and uh, they can only provide oxygen to one patient at the time but they couldn't run the oxygen machine 24 hours a day. So there were also times when they had to know they had to not use it to be able to preserve that resource. Mm -hmm. And then the struggle between, like, what are you going to do for people who are currently using it versus the, someone, the person who might come? Or they only need it so much, and there might be someone who comes and needs it more. Should they reserve it? Mm -hmm. um, so I think in the real world, uh, it's sort of, we're dealing with these things where it's the, it's the here and now and it's the hypo hypothetical later and the hy hypothetical other. And we need to be honest with ourselves about the emotional dimension uh, and then also um, to balance out with uh, just thinking about it as carefully and as clearly as, as we can. Um, so I don't think we can evacuate our emotions or, and I think we would be terribly worse off if we, weren't motivated by compassion and by empathy and these other things. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions about that? Yes. Um, just more just a question for the researchers. Um, so Dr. Hunt talks about um, criticizing in preparation. And so what clinicians or even educators or just um, people in this line of work, um, is there any existing program where we can have conversations like this, we can have more of a approach to learning. Great question. Do you know what's the point? Um, sorry, I didn't hear all So that. the question is, uh, in this context and the things we've been talking about in terms of preparation, uh, is there anything we could point to that might be a helpful thing to, for people to be involved in or to seek out as learners or as teachers, uh, people who might be involved, that they might Mm -hmm. wanted to seek out in terms of being able to do some of the preparation. I mean, I, I pointed to a few things. That our website might be something. We're trying to create a community of practice and experience so that the, we have this network that you could sign up to and there are different resources that were, uh, might be available. We are creating, um, as a start, this one e-learning module that people have uh, would have access to that we'll make available on our website. There are other courses that have been created. The Red Cross has a course that addresses some of the issues related to ethics. Um, I know that Gotham has been involved in simulation, for example, and so there are simulations that have been run, um, the more immersive experience where you know, they actually simulate people experiencing what it might be to res be responders and to the types of things that might happen. And so maybe Gotham can point you to that. It's the Humanitarian Studies Initiative, which is uh, affiliated with other institutions as well. Yeah, like full disclosure, it's a it's a for-profit company that I work with called Humanitarian oh. U. It was based out of Humanitarian uh, the Miguel Humanitarian Studies Initiative, um, and they partner with a bunch of different universities to deliver uh, a course that starts with an online lo learning program. So similar to what the Red Cross um, and what uh, I believe HHE is developing, 
And then they have a three-day simulation of going into the field or going into the field um, that's run by humanitarians. So they simulate some of these ethical challenges that you'll face, having to turn down one person over another, having a, sec a security challenge um, at a food distribution, and having to shut down food distribution because some group has um, threatened that. So there's there's that type of learning experience if you're interested in it. And, um, I can definitely share it afterwards if you're interested. There are a lot of free webinars from ICRC and the Humanitarian Policy Group, and if you sign up for web alerts from a group like uh, ALNAP, which is Accountability and Learning Network for Humanitarian Practice, um, they also you know, advertise webinars that often, not all of them, are about um, ethics in humanitarian action, so um, there's a lot of uh, free resources online. And I'm a big believer in learning from other people. So if you have a, I mean, I said reading stories is one thing, but also mm -hmm. if you have the opportunity to sit someone down, you know that they've had some experiences, so they've engaged with these things, um, just to take the opportunity to invite them for a coffee or people that you're in. And those sort of experiences, the first-hand experiences, I, I personally, I learn more from those conversations than I typically do from you know, uh, a course that I might attend, and this sort of, that sort of relationship can be a great opportunity for the sort of learning that you, I think you're, you're, you're hoping to acquire. A few other things, there's actually a course put on by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. It's an online course through FutureLearn, starting on the February 6th, and um, it's on health and humanitarian crises. And the other thing, Matthew actually recommended this book to me, um, Hugo Slim's uh, Humanitarian Ethics. Um, <coughs> I learned that absolute ton from that. I came from a microbiology background, so I have no ethics background at all, and it was definitely a, a, a worthwhile read, so I'd recommend that. <laughs> all right, well, if there's no more questions, thank you to our panelists for...